What up, what up, Ivy in the building, and we back for another video. My beard is getting long as fuck. I look like an old ass man. I gotta shave that thing. But uh, today's video is going to be the second team breakdown. And it's another Eastern Conference lottery team. A team that's been in the lottery for the past four years, ever since Jimmy Butler left. No, three years since Jimmy Butler left. And it's the Chicago Bulls. At the time of suspension, the Chicago Bulls were 22 and 33, which got them 11th in the Eastern Conference. I listed their core players as Zach Levine, Lowry Markkinen, Kobe White, and Wendell Carter Jr. Now, I don't really think that at the moment these players have enough talent or have shown enough to be definite players that they want to have in the future of their team. So I put them, I labeled them as core players with a little asterisk next to core players, but those are the four players that we're going to view as their core players. Four core bars. But um, yeah, let's start off with the player breakdown of Zach Levine. This season, Zach Levine averaged 25.5 points per game, 4.8 rebounds, 4.2 assists on 45% from the field, 38% from three on 8.1 three-point attempts per game. Now, an obvious strength of Zach Levine, the man is a pure bucket. He can score with ease. 38% from three on its own is good enough, but the fact that he's doing it on 8.1 attempts per game is ridiculous. And according to basketball reference, only 54.9% of those threes are assisted on, which means that a great percentage of those threes are coming off of his own creation, either outside of, or either through isolation or off of a pick and roll. And the man is athletic as hell. He's a two-time dunk contest champion, and he's quick as hell off the dribble. And Zach Levine is known as only a scorer. He's known as a scorer first guard, and as he should be, he's a walking bucket. But given that he's a two guard and a score first guard, getting 4.2 assists is solid enough for him. Now the obvious knocks against Zach Levine and his game is on the defensive end. And the advanced metrics, they basically hate him. He has a minus 0.8 box plus minus on defense, putting him at 133rd in the entire league. And I know that sometimes these advanced metrics can be a bit deceiving, but given that his teammate Chris Dunn is second in the entire league in defensive plus minus and a lot of their minutes are shared given that Chris Dunn is in the starting lineup I think in like 30 of the games played he started alongside Levine. The fact that he's second in defensive plus minus and Levine is all the way at 133rd I think that is a bit telling. And it's not just the defensive metrics that tell that he's a bad defender. The eye test can also suggest that he has a lot of blown assignments. It kind of seems like he's a lazy defender and he doesn't put as much effort in that he puts on offense, he doesn't apply that to defense as well. And that can come with playing with a coach that you don't respect and a coach that doesn't really, isn't too fond of you. And playing on a team that's been rebuilding for the past three years, that can kind of hamper down your defensive effort. So the questions with Zach Levine, what's his potential? What is his ceiling? Is he ever gonna be a number one option on a championship winning team? We've seen that he can put up 25 a game on a team that's mediocre to bad, but can he do the same thing on a championship winning team? I think he can. I think he has that offensive potential. There's a, there's this empty stats meme that goes around all these players that are putting up buckets on bad teams. Somebody has to score. And he's scoring when he's the main option on the team when everybody else isn't scoring. So the scoring potential is there. Can he be the best player on the championship team? No, probably not. I think he could be the second or third best player on the championship team, but hopefully he can prove me wrong. Another obvious question is, like I say, can he improve on defense? Um, I think if he played with a competent coach, unlike clown-ass Boyland, and on a team that wasn't perennially rebuilding, I think he would improve his defense because he'd be more invested in the team. And then the final question with Zach Levine is his future with the Bulls. He's on a two-year contract. Well, he signed a four-year contract two years ago, leaving two years left. And that, looking back on it, that's a really team-friendly contract uh, at 19 million a year for him. Do the Bulls see him as a long-term investment at the two guard because they have Kobe White who's backing him up and who really came onto the scene in February and March. So we'll just have to see how that pans out. The next player that we're going to break down is Lowry Markkinen. This is Lowry Markkinen's third year in the league. This year he's averaging 14.7 points a game, 6.3 rebounds on 42.5% from the field and 33.4% from three on 6.3 attempts. 
Now the strengths are obvious for Lowry Markkinen. He's a 7 footer who can shoot the lights out. He showed that in his rookie year and in his sophomore year. He has tremendous mobility for a big, especially a 7 footer. And especially given that the narrative around tall white guys is that they can't move. But he's proven the opposite, similar to how Kristaps Porzingis proved the opposite in his, in his mobility. Um, and Kristaps Porzingis has been, or I should say, Lowry Markkinen has been compared to Kristaps Porzingis the entire year because, you know, the white seven-footer thing that can shoot. So that parallel was always going to be drawn. But like I said, he's proven the ability that he can move really well for seven-footer. And he, he's even shown the ability to put the ball on the floor and slash and finish through contact with dunks above the rim. So all in all, the offensive potential is there. He's a seven-footer that can move, that can shoot the lights out. He's a threat from downtown and he can put the ball on the floor and drive and finish, what can he do on offense? Moving to some of his weaknesses for a 7-footer, he is a bit thin for his position, so if there is a low post for, or when he's playing the 5, if there's a low post threat down there that he has to defend, he's going to get moved around quite easily. His entire career, he's only averaged 0.6 blocks per game. That's got to improve, quite frankly. And watching him play, it sometimes looks like he's really content with just standing around on the corner waiting to get the ball and shoot it or standing in the corner. I don't know how much that has to do with Jim Boylan's game planning and Lowry Markkinen's aggression, but that has to be something that has to be looked at. I'm saying has way too much. And then when you dive further into that with metrics and whatnot, you can look at percentages of his shot attempts that have come with zero dribbles. In his sophomore year, when he averaged 18.7 points per game, 54.6% of his field goals made came with zero dribbles. This year, 69.2% of his shot attempts or shot makes have come with zero dribbles, meaning that he hasn't been much of a focal point of the offense, at least compared to his rookie and sophomore year. It looks like it's a combination of Jim Boylan only using him as a big that catches and shoots the ball without much shot creation for himself, and also just as a drop-off target inside the basket. Jim Boylan doesn't look like he's letting Lowry Markkinen create for himself as much as he did in his rookie and sophomore year. So the question is, how is he going to be used? Is he only going to be used as a stretch big that stretches the floor and does nothing else? Or is the next coach, because I can assume Jim Boylan's going to be out of there coming soon. Will the next coach and will this new front office view him as what he actually is? A stretch floor, stretch floor, a stretch floor that can spread the floor and also put the ball on the ground, drive on his own, create for himself in the post from time to time. How are they going to view him? Also, his restricted free agency is going to be coming up. How are the Bulls going to be committed to his development? Are they going to view him as a building block for the future? Or are they just going to view him as another guy on the team? The final question is, can he get back to the aggression he showed in his rookie and sophomore year? In my opinion, the offensive potential is there. I think he could drop 20 to a game on 40% from downtown if the Bulls would actually look to him more in the offense. And if Markkinen could believe in himself and be more aggressive on offense and demand the ball. The next player to break down is Wendell Carter Jr. This year is his second year in the league. He averaged 11.3 points per game, 9.4 rebounds, 0.8 blocks per game on 53.4% from the field and 20.7 from three, only on 0.7 attempts per game. Now his strengths, Wendell Carter Jr. is probably one of the most solid rookies or one of the more solid um, young players I've seen. And I mean solid in every sense of the word. Defensively, he doesn't really make too many mistakes. He's always in good position whenever it means helping out or sliding in front of the role man on offense or sliding in front of the offense's role man when he's on defense, switches. It doesn't seem like he makes too many mistakes. He's also a good finisher at the rim. He's shooting 69.4% from inside, 0 to 3 feet. He's also a good to great mid-range shooter. He's shooting 51.5% from mid-range, 10 to 16 feet. And he's a good rebounder at 9.4 rebounds per game, and he gets his fair share of offensive rebounds as well. So the big strength of Wendell Carter Jr., he is solid as hell, but that can also be his weakness. In terms of shot creation, he doesn't really show that, and coming into the league, there wasn't really an expectation for him to be a shot creator. And he's kind of undersized at the center position, even with this age of going smaller at every position. He's a little bit undersized at 6'9". Given that he's 6'9", even though he's solid at uh, on defense, 
if he's 6'9", he's going against a dominant low post big like Embiid or Jokic, he's going to get bullied down there. He is pretty strong at 2, I think he's 255, but still, being 6'9", is going to limit him against one-on-one uh, -on -one players in the post that are bigger than him. Now, you also may be thinking about Bam Adebayo, who's also 6'9", and he's a candidate for most improved player. But the thing about Bam Adebayo is he's better than... Wendell Carter on defense, and not only that, he's a lot more athletic. He's a bit bouncier, he's a bit quicker, um, so that can help him kind of overcome his height deficiencies while Wendell Carter is not the bounciest athlete in the world. He can stand to get more aggressive when it comes to finishing inside, um, instead of settling for floaters or flip shots around the rim, just dunk it. Be more of a, a force down low. Now I will say he has gotten better at that, moving on from his rookie year. In his rookie year, 12.4% of his field goals were dunks. That number has jumped up to 23.6%. And he's also improved his free throw attempts from 2.5 to 3.5, which means he's um, embracing contact more and looking to get to the line more. I alluded to his little flip shot floater game that he added, um, or that he's always had. I don't really know how to feel about that. According to Basketball Reference, this year he's shooting 28.6% from floater range, and he takes quite a few of them. Now if he's going to make them, then he can go ahead and take them, because in his rookie year he shot 42% from that floater range, so I guess if he's going to make them, he can continue to take them, make them, take them, shake and bake them. But um, if he's not going to make them, he needs to just... Overall, he just needs to be more aggressive, be more of a force down low, finishing over defenders instead of just settling for flip shots. Now the big question with his game, or the big weakness with his game is his lack of three point shot. And that's also a big question because in this league of spacing and big shooting, he's going to have to add that three point shot. Can he do it? He's 6'9". Given that he's 6'9", I think that makes him makes it more of an emphasis for him to add that. He's going to be undersized, so he's not going to be able to finish inside as much. He's undersized and not as bouncy as a typical 6'9 under, undersized center would be. So I think he definitely needs to add a three-point shot for his benefit, that he can be more useful, and for the team's benefit, so that his players can slash more and the floor will be a little more wide open for him. Given the fact that he does have a consistent mid-range shot at 52% for mid-range, 10 to 16 feet, I think he can and add that to his game. He's also a good free throw shooter. He shot 76.1% um, over his entire career. So those two things should point to him being able to add a three-point shot to his game. I also want him to be a bit more impactful on defense. I mean, it's good enough to be solid on defense um, in terms of positioning, staying in front of your man, switching at the right times. But I would like him to be a bit more impactful there. Maybe I think he definitely should get above a block a game at center given his defensive solidness. Um, I think he should eventually get up to maybe 1.4 blocks per game, something like that. Um, yeah, just be a bit more impactful. His durability is also kind of a big question. In his rookie year, he missed 43 games, and this year he missed 15 games, so we'll just have to see how that pans out. And another question mark, what is his potential? Is he the next Al Horford or something below that? I can't... I. I can't think of a similar player below, who plays like Al Horford, but below the caliber of Al Horford off the top of my head, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. The final player to break down is Kobe White. This was his rookie year. He averaged 13.2 points per game, 2.7 assists on 39.4 from the field and 35.4 from three on 5.8 attempts. So his efficiency in general from the entire field was kind of lackluster, but that's expected, especially from a rookie point guard or rookie guard in general but he did shoot 35.4 percent from three on high volume 5.8 attempts from three so that's a good sign thing to look out for for kobe white was his development and his play in february and march in february kobe white was actually named the rookie of the month where he averaged 20 a game four assists a game his efficiency improved to 43.3 from the field and he shot a ridiculous 41.1 from three. And the thing to take from this all is that all of those games were him coming off the bench. And then in March, given it was a smaller sample size, a much smaller sample size with five games, but he still did put up 22.4 a game, jumped up to six assists on 43.6 from the field and his three point percentage dipped to 31. 
but his efficiency also went up from his base efficiency the entire year. And another thing to take away from that was his plus minus. He was actually a plus player for those five games at 2.4. Now the strengths of Kobe White, it comes with his size. He's 6'4", meaning he can play either the point guard or shooting guard position. We'll have to see where the Bulls view him as going long term. And he's a confident shooter. Like I said, he shot 5.83s a game. That suggests that he believes in a shot. And he actually shot them at a decent efficiency. A good efficiency for a rookie point guard. And he showed great improvement in the later months of the year, February and March. He improved his playmaking a lot. There were plays in the pick and roll, especially in the pick and roll, where he was finding the roller, making a pocket pass or two. Or when the weak side defender slid over to the middle to stop the roller, he made a cross-court pass to the corner to that Ryan Archie Diacono. So he showed a lot of improvement in those two months. And then another strength is that he's young and he's showing improvement. Being young is always gonna be a strength because he's gonna have so much, so much room to grow. And keep in mind, this was only his rookie season and he's on a trash team that doesn't really have a good fit around him. So it's just, he's young, we'll have to wait and see. And then him being young can also be a weakness because his decision making was a bit lacking um, he's a bit raw, so again, development. His defense is kind of shaky on ball, and he's a bit slim for his position. I was alluding to the fact this entire uh, segment that he can play either point guard or shooting guard. If he were to be a shooting guard because he's more of a score first option, he's kind of thin for that position. He's already a bit undersized, but he's really thin for shooting guard, so he could stand to put on a couple pounds. And another weakness is kind of him playing with Levine. The fit isn't really there, so maybe he can be if he can improve his playmaking and court vision. Two big questions I have for him, or for the Bulls regarding him, is what position do they view him as? We'll have to wait and see. If he improves his playmaking to maybe six assists a game, he can play point guard, I think, next to Levine. But I think if he's always going to be this ball dominant point guard, Having him and Levine in the backcourt might be a bit problematic and also do they view Kobe White and Levine as the future backcourt of this team. And there will be more questions that arise the more we get to see him. We only got to see him this rookie year that got cut short. So Now this segment, I have been waiting to get to this segment. We're going to talk about the coach, Jim Clown as Boylan. Everybody knows about Jim Boylan. The man is not respected at all by his team. Uh, especially Zach Levine, if you've seen the, the clips that circulate across social media where Zach Levine's coming out of a timeout, a stupid timeout called by Jim Boylan where they're down like 12 with 20 seconds left in the game, or something like that. Zach Levine is just disgusted. Um, there's been numerous questions by the media questioning whether Zach Levine respects Jim Boylan. It's just, there's a lot of beef between them two. and. Um, it just doesn't seem like Jim Boylan has any control over that over that team, over that locker room. It just I just don't see it. My opinion, he has talent on this team and he just has not been able to do anything with it. Everybody knows the Eastern Conference is weak as hell. The Orlando Magic just continue to make the eighth seed. I this year I picked Chicago to make the eighth seed because Zach Levine and Lowry Markin in a full year of them together because they were injured the past two years. Um, and they've been they've been playing separately having them both together this year bringing in Wendell Carter jr um, I thought that would bode well for them I thought they could maybe sneak into an AC, but that just hasn't happened and then we look at the usage of Lowry marketing I mean I talked about it earlier his shot attempts dipped from 15 to 11 suggesting that Jim Boylan doesn't really view him as a go-to guy on the offense where everybody else in the basketball world views Lowry Markkinen as a player that has that potential. But Jim Boylan, for some reason, sees Lowry Markkinen as somebody that should just stand outside and shoot threes and not create for himself at all. Not Seeing that he averaged 19 a game, um, a lot of those games coming without Zach Levine, where Lowry Markkinen was the go-to guy and had to create a lot for himself, this year, doesn't want him to do that. That just doesn't make any sense. This power forward who is basically Porzingis 2.0 that moves well, can shoot, can put the ball on the floor, can move well for a big and finish out the rim above the rim. You don't want him? Whatever. I've already had my spiel about that. In 2018 to 2019, the percent of his field goals that came with a touch between 2 to 6 seconds was 36.2%. So 36.2% of his field goals came when he had the ball for two to six seconds. 
this year, that percentage has dropped to 23.2, 13 percentage, 13 percent points lower. So yeah, all of that suggests that Jim Boylan just doesn't know what he has in Lowry marketing. And then the last thing is probably the thing I have the most problem with is his coaching style. It's really high schoolish. Like the timeout that I talked about with Zach, where Zach Levine was disgusted. That is something that you would do in high school to high school athletes, kids that you're just trying to send a message to, that you're trying to look for all the growing moments of growth that you can. These are professional athletes. That's not something you do in the NBA with professional athletes. Oh, and then he had the thing where he was making, he was making them run suicides at the end of a practice after a back to back. That's another high schoolish thing to do. It's ridiculous. These are professional athletes. You don't make them run. You don't think they're in shape? What what kind of stuff is that? Last thing, the Bulls are 16th in pace of play. Now I could see a team being mediocre in pace of play if they have a go-to low post option and an isolation threat, like multiple players that can score efficiently, consistently, repetitively in an isolation play or basically in instances where offense is easy. Players, the Bulls don't really have that many players that can do that. Like Levine has been that only, he's been the only source of consistent offense created on his own self because Lowry Markin doesn't, I mean, Jim Boylan doesn't let Lowry Markin do that anymore. So the only player that can do that efficiently and effectively and consistently is Le Levine. And when you only have one player like that, you have to run more to get more easier looks for your team. The 16th in pace of play, they have Levine, bouncy as hell, quick as hell. He would thrive in the open, he thrives in the open floor whenever he gets a look there, and whenever he gets a fast break look, but he doesn't get it that often because they're mediocre in terms of pace. So you have Levine, two times slam dunk competition winner, fast as hell, he can't run as much. Kobe White, a rookie, young ass rookie, he's quick as hell on ball, he could run. He would probably thrive more in the open floor, get some more three on two looks. He could probably get his assist numbers up and scoring numbers up in the fast break, but nope. Lowry Markinen, mobile as hell for a big. Window Carter, undersized big that can beat centers up the floor. Like, you have this young ass team that can run and run and run, but you don't run with them. It just seems like Jim Boylan's coaching ways are just behind the times in terms of how we interacts with these players, how he wants to just act like a dictator, like he's a high school coach, and how he has this young ass athletic team, but he doesn't let him run. So the direction for this team, obviously they're rebuilding and believe it or not, they're projected to have the, <laughs> oh my God, they're projected to have the seventh pick again. Oh, uh, I hope that doesn't happen for them. But who do they go after? I kind of narrowed it down to three players that can kind of fall in that six to eight range. Um, Denny, Av Denny Avdiha. Yeah, that's how you say the name. Denny Avdiha, Tyrese Halliburton, and this has got other point guard's name. Uh, Killian Hayes. Um, Denny Avdiha, he's a foreign prospect. He's a small forward, six nine. Uh, from what I've read, I haven't really watched much tape on him, but from what I've read, it seems that he's like a multi-dimensional small forward that he can ISO, he can score on his own, um, create shots on his own, and he can also play make, he can also get the open man, and they have players at, Chicago already has players at shooting guard, power forward, and center, Wendell, Lowry, and Levine. And maybe even point guard if they view Kobe White as a point guard and he can improve his playmaking ability. The only hole is small forward and I don't think they view Otto Porter as a long-term small forward solution. So in terms of fit, um, position-wise, I think Denny of Deha has the best fit going with the young core that they already have in place. Uh, the other two players are point guards. We'll start with Tyrese Halliburton. He's out of Iowa State. Um, the big strength in his game is playmaking. Um, and that's really what Chicago needs, another playmaker that can play alongside Kobe White or Zach Levine and really facilitate for the entire team. We're talking more floppy plays with Zach Levine where Zach Levine can actually play off the ball more and not be the only guy that can run the offense and can generate some offense. Zach Levine would actually be able to play off the ball and get easier looks. The man shot 38% from three while a good percentage of those shots were 
off of his own creation. Imagine what he could do if he had somebody else setting him up. Then we had pick and roll plays with Lowry Marketing and Wendell. Pick and pop plays with Lowry Marketing, his efficiency would go up. And then Kobe White could play more off ball, probably where he would thrive more as a player. And Tyrese Halliburton is a good on ball defender according to these scouting reports. He's a good on ball defender and a disruptive one. He averaged 2.4 steals um, this year at Iowa State. That could be a really good player to put alongside Levine who has shown his defensive deficiencies. And let's say that they don't go with Zach Levine, they could, and they go in the direction of Kobe White at the two guard. Um, Kobe White is 6'4", he's kind of frail. Tyree Halliburton has size and he can probably guard the bigger, the bigger uh, backcourt member. And then for Killian Hayes, I saw a lot of similar things in terms of they're both 6'5", have good court vision, um, good defensive potential, and their shooting was a bit shaky. I saw that Killian Hayes, though he shot 43% or 40, wait, alright, well I don't know why my Mac is bugging, but the man shot 40, Tyrese Halliburton, he shot 43% or something like that his entire career in college and I think in this particular year he was shooting like 41% on 7 attempts per game which is really good but I saw that um, in his player profile that his mechanics were a bit flawed and his jump shot was a bit slow so he kind of would have to adjust but um, everything else I saw was pretty spot on in terms of a fit next to Zach Levine defensively and playmaking wise for this entire Bulls team and I saw similar things about Killian Hayes they're both 6'5 Killian Hayes is French though he plays overseas um, good playmaking ability good defender and kind of an inconsistent jump shot so basically kind of getting the same types of things out of uh, Killian Hayes and Tyrese Halliburton but yeah they Bulls will just have to select who they think in their uh, probably will work out who they think is the better player. But yeah, three potential players. Then you have Deha, Killian Hayes, and Tyrese Halliburton that I see going to the Bulls if they fall in that six to eight range in the first round. Personally, I honestly do not know. I don't really lean towards any other player. Any of the three players that I said, I don't really lean in one way or another. But if I had to put a gun to my head right now and pick one, I'd say I'd probably die because I can't really pick. I'm just gonna say Denny Abdiha because their hole is that small forward and he's really multi-dimensional and yeah. I, I would probably go Denny Abdiha, Killian Hayes, no no no. Denny Abdiha, Tyrese Halliburton, Killian Hayes in terms of um, my ranking of them for the Bulls. We'll see what they do though. Ultimately, they're making the decision, not me. So, plan of action for the Chicago Bulls. Number one priority, get Jim Boylan out of there. The man is a clown. The man is a bona fide clown. He's not respected in the locker room, not respected by the best players on the team. He doesn't know what he's doing. X and O's wise, he's trash. Um, he's not with the times in terms of this new age NBA. The man has to go. The man needed to go a year ago. Get him out of there. I, I assume that they are, given that there's a whole movement to sign him, and at this point, Jim Boylan is a coaching meme. And there's a new, I think there's a new general manager or president of basketball operations in. So I'm pretty sure they'll get him out of there. But yeah, number one thing, get him out of there. Number two, after you get Jim Boylan out of there, you gotta find your coach. Find a coach that has respect in the locker room, who is preferably younger and going with the new times of the NBA and one that can just competently know what he's doing. Know what he sees in Lowry marketing. Maybe get Zach Levine to buy in on defense. Something like that. Um, maybe encourage, um, what's his name, Wendell Carter to shoot more threes. Encourage that. Yeah, stuff like that. Just get a competent NBA coach who knows what he's doing. Also, general office, the general manager, president of operations, everybody in the front office, they need to display, they need to show to the NBA world, the NBA players that are going to be free agents, they need to show that they know what they're doing, that there's order in that franchise, because right now there is no direction, there's no order, there's no consistency in that franchise from top to bottom. Um, Garpax was a failure, they've been, in, they've been general manager and 
uh, president for I don't know how long, and it hasn't been a great time for them. I think they're finally out, but the new people that step into those roles, they gotta showcase that they know what they're doing, that they can establish order and consistency at the head coaching position, and that their players agree with the coaches and they're on the same page, yada, yada, yada. Basically, what I'm getting at is they also need to instill the Brooklyn Nets approach, like I said, for the Atlanta Hawks. Chicago is another big market, and they're actually kind of a free agency destination. Not on the same level of LA, um, the Lakers and Clippers, or the Knicks, and even the Nets now in Miami, but Chicago is one of the premier markets in the entire league, in the entire country. So if they can just showcase that they know what they're doing, that there's some consistency in the organization, then maybe that can attract some free agents and they can show that they have young talent like Zach Levine, Lowry Markinen, Kobe White, this new pick that's coming in. They can show that they have talent, get this team on the right direction, show that there's some order and sense of movement in the franchise, sense of direction. Then they can finally become free agency destinations again for the first time since they had a chance at LeBron James and whiffed. So yeah, that's the Chicago Bulls breakdown. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. But I actually want to say something um, regarding the channel. There's been a lot of people funneling into the channel that have shown love. And um, I've seen y'all in the comment section. I appreciate it supporting me. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. If you continue to do that. I'll continue to you know, be motivated to pump out content and um, trying to upload every day. So just keep on hitting that like button and I will follow through with that. Like I was saying, Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like and I will catch y'all later. Peace.